Dobry den, dot next, and uh, what is it? Uh, Dobry vecher Australia and uh, Dobry utro for America. And yes, very sorry that I'm I'm not back in in Russia with you right now. I'm streaming live from London, and as you know, London is the capital of Great Britain. And I'm going to talk to you today about something called the art of code. Now, the first computer system that I ever had way back in the 1980s was a computer called an Amstrad 6128. And it had 128K of RAM, about a two megahertz processor. It was not a very capable computer, but it did come with a programming language called Logo. And as a child, I loved Logo because I could use Logo to make the computer draw pictures. Now you have to, there was no Photoshop. There was no Microsoft Paint or uh, Inkscape or any of these things. Putting pictures on a computer screen was still a really big deal, really important idea to me. And so I played around with Digital Research Logo and I managed to get the computer to draw the pictures that I wanted. And when I did, I got this, this rush, this thrill of having, sense of having accomplished something. And you know, for me, the excitement of doing that, it's never gone away. It is something that has stayed with me throughout my entire career. And that's what I want to talk to you about today, because, you know, there's all kinds of important ideas that you're going to see here at, at dot next talk about uh, systems processing and high availability, distributed systems, performance, optimization, all of these kinds of ideas. But like I said, I want to talk to you about art, about the art of code. Now, there is a quote from the, the British writer Oscar Wilde. He said, all art is quite useless. And like I said, you're going to see a bunch of stuff at this talk, which is not useless. It's important. But maybe art is not actually useless. I like this quote as well. This is Douglas Adams, another British writer. And in, in his book, The Restaurant at the End of the Universe, he has this line, a function of art is to hold a mirror up to nature. We can use art as a tool to understand the world around us, the world we live in. And if we are going to do that, if we are going to hold a mirror up to nature, first we have to invent the mirror. And that is where science and technology is. Because for hundreds of years, we've used science and innovation and technology to understand the world around us and see things nobody has ever seen. We've invented scanning electron microscopes that have let us take photographs like, like this one here. This is crystals around the eyelid of a beetle. This is salt crystals growing in a dish of soya sauce. This here. This is fronds inside the stem of a banana leaf. And all of these things have existed since the dawn of time, but we never saw them. We'd never seen any of these until we invented the microscopes that allow us to take these kinds of photographs. And we've sent cameras and people and robots into space. And we've taken photographs like this one. This is the uh, Earth seen from beyond the rings, uh, from the dark side of the moon. We've seen this which is the pale blue dot, Earth from the rings of Saturn. Uh, excuse me one second, there's frantic pinging going on and I think they're trying to get hold of me. I don't know, that's the beautiful thing about these, these online presentations is once you're going, uh... <laughs> no, it's just people in the Telegram technical chat pinging each other in Russian and apparently nothing to do with, with the talk that's happening. That's all right, we, we, we can live with that. Um... <laughs> I don't know how many of you have tried doing one of these online presentations. It is really, really strange. Anyway, we were here. We were looking back at Earth from beyond the rings of Saturn, and we were looking at this, the pillars of creation in the Eagle Nebula, 6,000 light years away from Earth, photograph taken by the Hubble Space Telescope. And then within the last few decades, we have started to explore another world of science and information, a world of mathematics. Throughout the 1970s, Martin Gardner wrote a column every month in Scientific American magazine. And in October 1970, he wrote this column, this mathematical games column, he introduced us to something called Conway's Game of Life. Now, John Conway died a few months ago, and uh, there was a lot of stuff about it in the scientific press. And one of the things that John Conway said is, I don't want to be remembered for the game of life, you know. And he worked on lots of amazing stuff, but I'm sorry, John, the game of life is what I remember you for, uh, because the game of life was was fascinating and memorable now the rules of the game of life are simple 
It's a game for no players played on an infinite grid, and it has only four rules. Each of the cells on the grid can be living or it can be dead. If a cell has zero or one neighbors, it will die of loneliness. If a cell has two or three neighbors, it will survive into the next generation. If a cell has four or more neighbors, it will die of overcrowding. And if a cell has exactly three living neighbors on the next generation, that cell will come back to life. Now that's it. You now know the entire rules of Conway's Game of Life. You know everything there is to know about that game. And when it was first published, people played the Game of Life using graph paper. They would draw diagrams with pencils and try and figure out how these different shapes would behave over successive generations. But studying the Game of Life with graph paper is like looking at butterflies in a museum. You know, you, you can see what they look like, but you have no idea what they actually do. You have no feeling for how they behave. It wasn't until we started using computers to simulate the game of life that we worked out what behavior we were actually seeing here. Here are the five Tetris shapes, the pentominoes. And you can see four of these shapes, they very, very rapidly stabilize. They settle down to stable configurations. But the fifth one here goes into this infinitely repeating crisscross zigzag pattern, a pattern we call traffic lights. Now, one of the earliest questions, is the game of life finite or will it expand forever? Very early on, a team discovered this. This shape is called the glider and the glider just repeats itself. It keeps gliding across the infinity of the grid, repeating itself every seven generations. But that was just the beginning. We discovered shapes like this. This is the glider gun discovered by Bill Gosper and his team. It repeats every 27 generations, and every time it repeats, it gives birth to another glider and sends that glider streaming out across the grid. This is another shape. This one's known as the eater. This will destroy gliders without destroying itself in the process. And so now we have a way to create signals and a way to destroy signals. We have binary one and zero, true and false. And it turns out we can use the game of life to create logic and logic gates. This is an AND gate implemented in the game of life. We have two inputs, A, B, and we have an output here, A and B. Now, if we set one of these inputs to true, when we begin our circuit, we get no output. Only one input is true, no output. Let's try setting the other input to true. We set B to true, we run the circuit, and when it stabilizes, we have no output. But now if we set both of those inputs to be true, we allow A equals true, B equals true, and then we run the circuit. And look at that. We've created an AND gate in the game of life. And it turns out that if you can construct logic gates in any system, you can use that system to create circuits. And if you can create circuits in a system, you can build computers. And if you can build computers, you can run programs, including this program, which you may have seen recently. It's a program called Conway's Game of Life. Now, Conway's Game of Life is just one of a whole family of mathematical systems which exhibit incredibly complex behavior arising from very, very simple rules and initial conditions. Uh, I'm just going to close the Telegram chat because I think the audio on that is feeding across. Uh, let's shut that and shut that. I'll be back with you in one second here. Um, okay. <laughs> I'm going to keep doing the talk. So, uh, yes, Conway's Game of Life, one of a whole family of systems. Now, you may have heard of this phenomenon, something called the butterfly effect, uh, which has to do with long-range weather forecasting. The idea that weather is such a complicated system, it's so sensitive to its initial inputs, that if a butterfly flaps its wings in Beijing this week, next week we're going to have hurricanes instead of sunshine in Sao Paulo. And the, the study of these kinds of intuitive systems it stemmed out of a bunch of work that started with studying one of the most interesting things in mathematics. Now, if I draw a square here, 
the area of the square is two by two, although the, the dimensions of the square are two by two. What is the area of the square? It's four, right? But if I draw another square on the same set of coordinates, which is minus two by minus two, what is the area of this square? It's also four. So is there some number that we can create that will allow us to multiply that number by itself and get a negative result? Now, this does not exist in nature, but mathematics pops up and mathematics says, well, hey, don't worry, let's just make something up. Let's imagine this number i. Let's imagine i squared equals minus one. Now, this is it. We've pulled a number out of nowhere. We've conjured it. We've imagined it. And we've said that this imaginary number multiplied by itself is going to give you a negative result. Now, where things get really interesting is when we start combining these imaginary numbers with real numbers. We get what are called complex numbers. This is an example of a complex number plotted on something called an Argand diagram. A complex number is like a software project plan. It has a part that is real and it has a part that is imaginary, and it makes it impossible to predict what is going to happen next. So we have this number here, 0 0.8 plus 1.2i. And it turns out that we can use these complex numbers to do arithmetic. We can take 0 0.8 plus 1.2i and we want to square this. So we just expand the brackets like we all did in high school and we multiply the component parts of this together. The only change, anytime two imaginary numbers get multiplied, you flip the result and it comes out negative. So we can expand these out we collapse all the sums at the end, and we can do arithmetic with complex numbers. Now, the first people to really study the arithmetic of complex numbers were uh, two French mathematicians, Gaston Julier and Pierre Fatou, in around like 1915, 1916. They published this paper in 1918, uh, Memoir sur l'iteration de fonction rationnelle, Memoir on the iteration of rational functions, because what they were doing they weren't solving equations, they were studying them, and they were studying how they behave. Take a look at this example. We have a, some function, x maps onto x plus one. And so we take x and we add one, and we add one, and we add one. And you can see very, very quickly how this is gonna behave all the way up to infinity. There are no surprises here. If we say x goes to two minus x, well, x is zero, two minus zero is two, two minus two is zero, two minus zero is two, zero. And this is just going to loop round and round and round. If we try x goes to x squared, 4, 16, 256. If we start with a number that's less than 1, we go 0 0.5, 0 0.25, and we very rapidly tend towards zero. But in all these cases, you can instinctively see how you get a very intuitive feel for how these are going to behave over lots and lots of iterations. If we take a complex number, 0 0.7 plus 0.8i, and we square it, it is going to go from here to here. But then the next iteration from here to here, and then it's going to jump over here, and then it's going to jump up here, and then it's going to vanish off towards one of the different infinities that exist off the boundaries of, of this graph here. Now let's look at a bunch of numbers that are almost next to each other on our starting conditions. This one here, 0 0.9 plus 0.8i, that goes straight off towards negative infinity. 0 0.8 plus 0.8i goes off to real infinity. Plus 7.8i goes off to positive imaginary infinity. Now this one here, look at this, this is 0.6 plus 0.8i. And this one doesn't go anywhere. This one kind of bounces around for about a hundred generations. It just bounces at one point, it looks like it's gonna draw a circle here around the origin. And then eventually, just as it looks like it's never gonna go anywhere, it disappears off to negative imaginary infinity. 0.5 plus 0.8i disappears down the zero, down the origin in the middle. 0.4 plus 0.8i does a similar thing. These points are almost exactly next to each other, but they exhibit dramatically different behavior. And all we're doing is squaring, squaring, squaring each time. Now, the person who really got to the, like, did the, the most useful work in the study of these systems was this guy, Benoit Mandelbrot. Uh, Mandelbrot was born in Poland. He grew up in France. He emigrated to the United States. He was a mathematician and he had a fantastic job because he spent half the year studying mathematics and teaching mathematics at Harvard University. And when he got bored of teaching, he'd go to IBM and hang out in their research laboratories. And IBM had computers at a time when most people didn't. And between these two, Harvard and IBM, Mandelbrot was studying the mathematics of nature. He was obsessed with the mathematics of the world around us. He had this very famous quote, clouds are not spheres, mountains are not cones, coastlines are not circles, bark is not smooth, and nor does lightning travel in a straight line. Now, 
the shape, the, the idea, the equation that you've probably heard of that bears Mandelbrot's name came from his study of this equation. Z goes to Z squared plus C. You square the complex number and you add C, which is the number you started with. So you square a point and you add the number you started with and square it again and add the number you started with. And if after, say, 100 generations, that point has still not disappeared to infinity, you color in that point on your grid. Just plot something there. And this is the algorithm that was used to produce the first ever plot of what is known as the Mandelbrot set on an IBM teleprinter sometime in the 1970s. Now, we got much, much better at doing computation. We invented high-resolution color displays. We invented supercomputers that could do billions of calculations per second. And we came up with this algorithm it says, if the shape goes off to infinity very quickly, color it in blue. If it takes a little while to get there, purple. If it's very, very slow, color it in a brighter color, red or yellow or white. And if it never tends to infinity, color it in black. And that is the algorithm that we use. Now, I built and ran this on my 286 PC back in the 90s. It took about seven hours to draw this level of detail. But today, we have computers that can do what we call the deep Mandelbrot zoom. Now, I'm going to start zooming in, and I'm going to test all of those image compression codecs and everything that are running out there on this call that I'm streaming live to all of you, because we're going to bring up this Mandelbrot set, and we're going to start zooming in. And around about now, let's call that magnification level one, where it's about just about filling the screen. And so we're going to keep going in. We get to about level 10 here. That original shape is probably larger than your house or your apartment. And we keep zooming in. And very, very quickly, we start getting to a level of detail where the original shape is now larger than a city, larger than a country, larger than the continent of Europe, larger than planet Earth. We're going to keep zooming in. Now, we are not ever going to run out of detail because there is an infinity of complexity buried inside the Mandelbrot set. That one equation, z goes to z squared plus c, we can keep zooming in forever, forever, forever. Now we will find things like this. This is not an exact replica. It's called self-similarity. It's kind of the same, but not exactly the same, because if it was exactly the same, we'd know it was repeating and we could stop. And we could zoom in on this and we'd find another layer of infinite levels of detail all buried there inside this shape. And all that came from this one equation. But you think about you know, what we had to do, what human beings had to do to discover this shape, because we didn't invent this. We discovered this. This is baked into the fabric of the mathematics of our reality. We had to invent imaginary numbers. We had to invent computers. And you know, a computer is basically, we stuck lightning inside a rock until it learned how to think. We developed complex arithmetic. We developed high definition color displays. And you know, the way I'm streaming this talk to you now, you think about the technology that's involved in doing that. And all of this, <laughs> All of this so that we can witness things like this, the Mandelbrot set. Now, there are some people who have said that the Mandelbrot set is the thumbprint of God. Now, I'm not a very spiritual person, but I do like to play computer games. And I enjoy that thing in a computer game where, you know, you go off in some random direction on a level. You find something maybe you weren't supposed to see, and you go digging, and there's something been left there by the game level designers that just says, you're doing all right. You were supposed to see this. You're on the right track. So I, I like to take some reassurance from that. Now, just putting pictures on a computer screen has not been a big deal for a long while. 1980s, we had the movie Tron, where Disney brought these computer-generated scenes onto our cinema screens and stuff. We had Luxo Jr., which was a completely computer-generated short cartoon. We had Jurassic Park with computer dinosaurs and real scenery and real human actors. We had this guy who, now who is this? Is this the British dead act Peter Cushing? Or is this the fictional Lucasfilm character Grand Moff Tarkin? You know, we don't know. But we have the technology now that allows us to have living actors playing dead characters and dead actors playing living characters. There's pretty much no limit to what technology can do. We can even say, I wonder what would happen if they remade the TV show Friends, but they got Nicolas Cage to play all of the parts. <laughs> Boy, I mean, that, that was, uh... 
terrific. Really? You're bitching. Now, the reason we can do stuff like that is that we have started to build machines that can mimic the way our own brains work. You ever lie on your back in a field on a sunny day and you look up at the clouds as they race across the sky and you see these shapes. You think, oh, that one, that's a rabbit. And that one looks like a cat and that one looks like a house. And what's happening is that your brain is running pattern recognition algorithms. Now, we don't know exactly how the brains work, but we have managed to create something called a convolutional neural network. We take a whole bunch of layers of logic which haven't been programmed yet, and then we train them. We say, here's a thousand pictures of cats. Here's a thousand pictures of dogs. You go and figure it out. And the neural network runs over these data sets, and eventually it goes right. I've got it. Now I can I can recognize dogs and cats. And you know, it doesn't sound that difficult. Like how hard it is to tell the difference between a puppy and a muffin. Well, it turns out it's actually a lot more difficult than anybody gives us credit for. But what gets really interesting is when we take those neural networks, we take the dog detector and we flip it around, we wire it in backwards and we say, now this is a dog amplifier. And then we feed it input that does not contain dogs and we say, amplify the dogs. And the system says, I think this is a bad idea. Please, can we not do this? And we say, nope enhance the dogs and we get the first generation looks like this and we say turn up the power and the neural network says no no you're going to regret this and we say we don't care turn up the power and we get results like this now this is a completely new form of art this is something that did not exist until we built the algorithms and systems that allowed us to do it it's called deep dreaming it came out of a project at google called deep dream and this is weird. This kind of art is, is profoundly unsettling because it tricks those same circuits in our brain that are used to recognize the world around us. When you look at this, part of your brain sees dogs and then you look closer and there aren't any dogs. And so you keep seeing things that get sent upstairs. Hey, look, there's a dog, there's a dog, there's a dog. And you look at it closer like there aren't actually any dogs here. And you know, this is just one of the wonderful and weird forms of art that are only possible thanks to innovation in modern computers and software and algorithms. Algorithms. Now, up until now, we've talked about using software to create art. But what I want to talk about now is software that is art. Because I'm sure you've all had this, this conversation. There's this classic book by Donald Muth, The Art of Computer Programming. And I'm sure you've all had those conversations where you're looking at a piece of code and you're like, I don't know what this is. Is, is this, you know, are we engineers? Are we typists? Are we artists? Is, is code a creative process? Is it science? You know, what are we actually doing here? Where do we fit into the, the pantheon of human endeavor? Um, and I've looked at code before, sometimes code that I wrote myself a little earlier when I was tired and I've been like, this is not science. This is not engineering. This is not art. I, I don't know what this is, but the good news is there is now a safe place for this kind of code, the obfuscated C code contest. Now, the objectives of the obfuscated C code context are to write the most obscure C programs, to show the importance of programming style in an ironic way, to stress C compilers with unusual code, to illustrate the subtleties of the C language, and to provide a safe forum for poor C code. Let's have a look at some code here. So, here is a complete source code listing. This is prog.c. Any C programmers out there? I know it's a .NET conference, but some of you might have done some C. You want to have a guess at what this does? Let's run it and find out because, hey, what's the worst that can happen? So we're going to make it and we're going to run it. <laughs> and there we go. Look at that. Flappy Bird implemented in a Linux terminal in 1,024 bytes. Here's another one. Now, you're not going to get any points for nice, elegant code formatting based on this, but wait and see what happens when we zoom out on this code base, because this is a Mandelbrot set generator written in C, less than one kilobyte of C, that looks like a Mandelbrot set. Now, obfuscated code contests started in C, but then they spread the net a lot wider, started picking up all kinds of languages. And we started seeing things like this. Now, this is 1,024 bytes of JavaScript. You can copy and paste this into a web browser, and when you click Refresh, it plays chess. It doesn't draw a chessboard, it plays chess. This is a complete chess engine, including the graphics, the rendering, the board layout, and an engine that actually knows what move to make next and can beat me. This is a better chess player than that Amstrad 6128 that I talked about at the beginning there. Now. 
1994, somebody called Simon Rasinkovich submitted this program to the obfuscated story. It's not a problem with the stream. This is a blank slide because this is an empty file, zero bytes. And it came with a readme file that says, if you compile this using this particular C compiler, it will produce a program, a valid program that creates no output. Therefore, this program prints its own source code. He got an award. They said, well done, Simon. That's very impressive. Then they changed the rules of the obfuscated C code contest to say your program must be at least one character. But this brings us onto the idea of something called a quine. Now, a quine is a program that prints its own source. We get the term quine from this book, Gödel, Escher, and Bach by Douglas Hofstadter, where he talks about somebody called William Ormand von Quine, who was a philosopher who studied statements that refer to themselves. Now, you're not allowed to cheat. You're not allowed to just read the program off disk and print it. A quine actually has to generate its own source. Let's have a go at, at building one here in C Sharp. So we've got a class program which has a static void main. And we want to print the source code to this program. So we need to console write line the first line, which is class program. And then we'll console write line the static. And then we need to, to console write line the console write line the console write. And then, and you can see very quickly, we're going to get tangled up in layers of recursion. The whole thing's going to fall apart. So. What if we cheat? What if we use string templating, which is a language feature built into C Sharp? So we're going to take a string here, class program, static void main, and we're going to put var s equals, and then these three placeholder variables, 0, 1, 0. And then we are going to do the system console write line. But then, and this is the fun part, we are going to feed that template string back into itself so that it prints a copy of itself. And when we run this, this program is going to print its own source code. Now, you can write quines in all sorts of languages, and all of them have their own little loopholes and peculiarities that we can use to make this work. In JavaScript, everything has two string on it. So in JavaScript, this is a quine. f.toString returns its own function definition. And in ECMAScript 6, this is a quine. Now, I didn't believe this for a second because it looks ridiculous. So I took this and I loaded it into the console in Chrome and I ran it. And sure enough, that snippet produces its own source code when you run it. Now, question, do you think it is possible to build a quine in HTML? Let's have a look. Here is a web page. This is inspired by a, a brutalist HTML quine by a guy called Leon Bambrick, the secret geek on Twitter, who's absolutely brilliant. You should all follow him. Um, and I, I got this idea from something that he created. Now, the source code for this web page looks like that. It's uh, HTML, head, title, nothing terribly sophisticated here. But we can start exploiting some quirks in the way web browsers work. We can put a rule in, a CSS rule that says display everything. Display everything in a block with a monospaced font. And now we can start seeing bits of the web page that humans were never supposed to see. We can use some pseudo selectors to put a slash H uh, HTML and a slash HTML. And when we jump back over here, we now have HTML at the top of the page there. We don't have slash HTML because it's fallen off the bottom of the screen. But hey, we've told it to render it after the end of the page. Where would you put it? Hmm? Let's plug in a couple more. So we've got a style sheet rule. Now you'll notice here that the content on the style after is backslash full slash. We need to escape the HTML parser that is looking for slash style because that means, hey, style's finished. Start doing HTML stuff again. That gives us style and slash style. We can plug in a bunch more. There's no way to generate these. So we've got title, A, P, before and after. That gives us this. We are then going to come over and we are going to plug in here. We need that ahref to tell us the web address that it is actually going to. Content ahref, and we're going to extract the value of the attribute. And we're going to drop that in here. Finally, I'm going to add one more little rule in here. I'm going to say 16 pixels margin, 1% on the height. There we go. We've created a web page that prints its own source code. Completely useless. But how much did you learn about HTML and CSS parsing by watching the way that was put together? Now then, take a look at this. Take a moment to read through it, have a proper look, and tell me what language do you think this program is written in? Now, some of you out there are like, well, hash include standard io.h. This is obviously C. So, yep, let's have a look. There it is with C syntax highlighting applied to it. It's not a terribly 
clean or, or minimalist C program, but it's valid C. But now I'm going to take the same thing and I'm going to apply Ruby syntax highlighting to it. And I'm going to highlight the string literals that are here. And this also looks like a valid Ruby program. So which is it? Is it C or is it Ruby? Let's run it. My, my polyquine interpreter and I'm going to just show you I've got the polyquine.c that's the source code there and then I'm going to run it through GCC it's going to give me a valid program the warning generated but <laughs> if you didn't want to see warnings you came to the wrong talk and there it is it prints its own source code so now I'm going to run the same thing but this time I'm going to run it through the Ruby interpreter so let's run Ruby on that C program and we get its own source code Let's run it through Python and see what happens because, hey, you know, why not? Python's a nice language. And there we go. It prints its own source code. And now, just for fun, I'm going to run it through Perl. And in Perl, that prints its own source code. This program is a syntactically valid quine in five different languages. It'll also run in C++ if you can find a compiler that doesn't complain about main not having a return type on that. Now. Polyquines are languages that print their own source or are valid in more than one language. Talk about polyglot coding. And I want you to have a look at this code and tell me what language this program here is written in. Because we've got a system.console here. That's kind of like a .NET thing, right? And we've got an XML namespace with some XSL transform going on here. And we've got a for each with a console.log. And we've got an A. Uh, we've got begin in block capitals, which means it's a serious business language like SQL or COBOL or something. And we've got act one, scene one, enter Ajax, which doesn't even look like any kind of computer program, right? So what is it? This is a thing called the Ouroboros Quine. It is a program written in Ruby. And when you run the Ruby program, it creates a Rust program. And when you run the Rust program, it creates a Scala program. And the Scala program creates another program, creates another program. It goes around, it loops around through 128 languages until you end up with a RAT4 program that produces a Rex program that produces the original Ruby program back again. And that's not even the cool part. The source code to the Ouroboros Quine looks like this. Now, that's not even the cool part. Let's zoom in on the end. Look at the very, very end of this file here. We're going to zoom in on the last five or six lines there. You see all that? Buffer for future bug fixes. This thing has a maintenance plan. Somebody has anticipated. Hello. <laughs> there are no sounds on my phone. The problem is the Telegram desktop client, which I cannot find. Ah, I'm just. <sighs> All right, we're back. Bug fixes, buffer for future bug fixes. So this thing has a maintenance plan. And that's not even the good part. The good part of this is all of those 128 languages are available through GitHub Actions. You can apt-get install them on Ubuntu Linux, which means you can create a Docker container that will install and run all 128 of those languages and do a continuous integration pass on this. So every time there's a change to this, it runs it through 128 different languages to make sure that it's still valid. OK. <laughs> What was going on there with Act 1, Scene 1, Enter Ajax? Well, Act 1, Scene 1, Enter Ajax is from an esoteric programming language called Shakespeare, which is designed for creating programs that are also Shakespeare plays. Hello World in Shakespeare looks like this. Now, the way variables work, some languages have block scope, some languages have lexical scope. Shakespeare. <clears throat> has scene scope. In order to introduce variables into a into a, a, a scene, you have to say act one, scene one, 
Enter Hamlet and Romeo. Hamlet then says to Romeo, you lying, stupid, fatherless. Now, every time Hamlet insults Romeo, it decrements the value stored in the Romeo variable. You are as stupid as the difference between a handsome, rich, brave hero and thyself. Speak your mind. We're doing some basic arithmetic. When we get to speak your mind, it outputs on Hamlet. It causes it to output the value that is currently stored in Romeo, which is the letter H. You are as brave as the sum of your fat little stuffed, misused, dusty old rotten codpiece. This whole chunk here is going to print the letter E. We turn to page two. L, L, Hello World in the Shakespeare programming language runs to about three or four pages. But that's okay, because Shakespeare was not noted for being short. Have a look at this program here. What language do you think? Now, this is not a problem on the stream. This is a programming language called white space. Here it is with syntax highlighting applied. The pink things are spaces, the blue things are tabs, and the white space language ignores everything else. This is hello world in white space. Now, there is another esoteric programming language, which is called Chef. And Chef is designed for writing programs that are also recipes, programs you could implement in your kitchen. Now, the Hello World souffle, the canonical Hello World in Chef, 72 grams of haricot beans, 101 eggs, 108 grams of lard. This does not look like a terribly appetizing recipe, right? So a guy called Mike Worth went, I wonder if it's possible to create a, a, a recipe, a program in Chef that is also actually edible. And he created this, the Hello World cake with chocolate sauce. Now, if you implement this, and run it in the chef interpreter, it prints hello world. If you implement it and run it in your kitchen, you get a cake, you get an actual edible cake. And the people eating that cake will have no idea that the thing that they're eating is actually a computer program. Now, I love that idea. Let's have a look at another example. This is how to square a number in the programming language called Pete. That is the source code. Pete is a graphical programming language. It has an instruction set that is made up of transitions of color and lightness. This is the color palette that it supports, and this is how Hello World actually works. The instruction pointer starts in the top left corner. When we cross from light blue into dark green, we get prompted to input a number. When we hit black, the program pointer changes direction. When we cross from light green to dark red, we duplicate the number that is at the top of the stack. When we cross from red into yellow, that multiplies the two values on the top of the stack and puts the result back onto the stack. When we cross from yellow back into red, output. Whatever's on the top of the stack, print that. Crossing white here is a no operation. That gets us into blue. We hit the edge of the grid. We change direction. We keep going as far as we can until we end up with black on all sides. Halt. Now, this is hello world in the Pete programming language. Now, what I love about this, you could print this out, you could hang this up on the wall in your house, and no one would ever know they were looking at a computer program. Nobody would know that they were looking at, at hello world. Now, in a conference like this one, something like Dot Next, you often see people doing live demos and live presentations. And you know, live performance always has an element of, of uncertainty in it. There's always a, a risk or an element that something isn't going to go quite according to plan. That's what makes it exciting. And you know, we it's interesting in technology because when we go to conferences, it's cool to see live demos where something might go wrong. But when we do production systems and automation and delivery pipelines, we hate it if something could go wrong. We want everything to be reproducible. We want everything to be scripted and controlled and automated. And we have this expression, you talk about a snowflake server. You know, a snowflake is a, a server you can't touch. Don't install Windows Update. Don't patch it. If you do that, everything will stop working. Never, ever install anything on that server. But every snowflake in nature is unique. And if you pick a snowflake out of a blizzard and you just put it on your hand and you let it melt, you've just been part of a unique experience that nobody else will ever share it. And that's what makes performance exciting. The idea that there is something going on there which is not going to be repeated. Now, 
This is the Royal Albert Hall here in London. Sitting up there underneath the big screen is a guy called Sam Aaron. And Sam created a programming language called Sonic Pi. Now, if I could ask the engineers to bring up the audio share on the Zoom call here, I'm going to do a quick demo for you of how Sonic Pi actually works. Because Sonic Pi is a musical programming language. When you first run Sonic Pi, the primitive instructions are based around the idea of playing notes. Play A3. That will play that note. That's the third A key on a piano. <laughs> play C4. That will play the third note on a piano. If you play three instructions, Sonic Pi executes all your instructions simultaneously, unless you introduce sleep statements like this. You know, imagine if... <laughs> Uh, we're getting a lot of feedback. Whoever else is on this call is going to need to mute everything except the vMix because I'm getting audio loops feeding back. All right, I think we've sorted it. So we've got a loop there. 16 times do this. Now we're going to crank this up a little bit. We're going to say 244 beats per minute. And I'm going to introduce a slightly more interesting synthesizer voice there. I'm going to drop in a thing called TechSaws. <laughs> Now, where Sonic Pi gets really, really interesting is when we introduce the idea of something called a live loop. Because you can rewrite a Sonic Pi program while it is actually running, and you can manipulate it and you can change it without the program skipping a beat. So what we have here, we have a live loop main. Now, I'm going to go in and I'm going to drop another loop in on top of that. And I'm going to say, play this symbol, drum symbol closed, 15 times, and then play the drum symbol open. And you see now we have this, this riff, and we've got some percussion behind it. I'm going to copy and paste another loop over the top of that. And you hear the way it just keeps running over and over and over, and it doesn't lose beats. There's no delays occurring in the execution. Now, I'm going to put a counter variable in this loop here. And I'm going to start doing some arithmetic tests. I'm going to say, if the current note is divisible by three, play a different note. And if the current note is divisible by the number five, I want you to play another different note. And finally, now some of you might recognize the algorithm that's being implemented here. If the number is divisible by 15, I want you to play another different note. Now take a listen to this. This is the fizz buzz riff. Implemented in Sonic Pi, the musical programming language. Now, <laughs> I've talked about a whole bunch of cool stuff that other people have done. I want to wrap up the talk today by telling all of you about something that I did. Because you might have come across this idea that we get in technology of people trying to hire rock star programmers and rock star JavaScript engineers and rock star front end and rock star this and rock star database people. And you know, this has been going for years and years and years. And a few years ago, Paul Stovell from Octopus Deploy put this on Twitter. He said, to really confuse recruiters, someone should make a programming language called Rockstar. And I had this moment of divine revelation. I thought, this is what I need to do. This is what the world needs. We need a Rockstar programming language. And that language needs to let you write computer programs that look like bad heavy metal songs, because that's what the world really needs. And so I created Rockstar a dynamically typed Turing complete programming language designed for creating computer programs that are also song lyrics, heavily influenced by the lyrical conventions of 1980s hard rock and power ballads. Now, I invented Rockstar in a bar as a joke. This is important, and you'll find out why a little later. Rockstar started life as a parody specification. I thought, hello world, we need a couple of different ways. So first of all, say hello world. This is easy, nice and simple. But we also would like to be able to scream hello world, or whisper hello world, or shout hello world. We need a way of assigning variables. Now, you know, in most languages, you have x equals 5, my string, the message. Now, first of all, we're going to make this dynamically typed, and we're going to lose the semicolons, because punctuation is not terribly rock and roll. Now, this equals sign is not very musical. We're going to drop that. Instead of x equals 5, we'll say, well, x is 5. Yeah, my string is hello world. The message is coding rocks. Now, 
I saw a talk that Douglas Crockford gave a few years ago, the, the JavaScript and JSON guy. Um, and he was talking about ideas that are so deep, we don't really talk about them. We just kind of nibble at the edges around them. And he said, we have all these arguments about Pascal case versus camel case versus snake case versus chainsaw case, when what we really want is variable names with spaces in them. And so I thought, well, hey, I'm inventing a programming language in a bar for a joke variable names with spaces in them, no problem at all. Now, it's not a complete free-for-all. I had some rules about this based on English grammar. So you can have simple variables, which are the same as Ruby, Python, Visual Basic. Common variables have to start with one of these keywords, my heart, an ocean, your dream, a kiss, the night. And then proper variables have to start with capital letters. So you can write songs that are programs about people like Dr. Feelgood and Black Betty and, and Billie Jean. Now, in programming, we often have to initialize variables with numbers. And in most languages, x equals 3, y equals 5. Now, I didn't want to do that because it's not terribly musical. I had an idea. What if we take the is operator, fizz is, and then we look at the next thing. And if the next thing is not a number, we'll count the number of letters in each of those words and add them together. Fizz is ice, one, two, three. That's a digit. Dying, one, two, three, four, five. That's a digit. Eight. Now, love struck is a 10 letter word. So take it modulo 10, that gives us the digit zero. One, zero, zero. We have a way of initializing three, five, and 100 so that we can make fizz buzz. We need a way of initializing floating point numbers. Now, in C sharp, decimal pi equals 3.1415. In JavaScript, var pi equals 3.14. And JavaScript uses IEEE arithmetic, so I wouldn't bother too much with precision on it anyway. In Rockstar, my heart was ice, a life unfulfilled, waking everybody up, taking booze and pills. We need a way to do arithmetic. Now, in English, you talk about how much is it? Well, it's the price with the tax. How much is the subtotal? Oh, it's the total without the tax. We talk about the quantity of the product. That's multiplication. We talk about distance over time in physics. That's division. But this also allows us to write arithmetic like a girl with a dream, a man without a face, the wings of the night, a whisper over the water. We need comparisons. Your love is a lie. Equality, true or false? Is it true or is it not true? The whiskey ain't the answer, not equal to. My heart is stronger than steel. My soul is weaker than water. My will is as strong as a lion and your lies are as low as a snake. Now, I needed a function syntax. And if you listen to programmers talk about functions, somebody will say something like, hey, how does, how does modulo work? And someone will go, well, you know, modulo, it takes the number and the divisor. And then this is how you do modulus with repeated subtraction, by the way. While a number is as high as a divisor, put a number without a divisor into a number. Now there's a blank line there that terminates a block statement in Rockstar. Give back a number is how you do return. But also, midnight takes your heart and your soul. While your heart is as high as your soul, put your heart without your soul into your heart. Give back your heart. Now, at this point, the specification is pretty much done. I've got a joke language that you can build fizzbuzz in. I put a spec up on a GitHub repo. I put it on Twitter. I get a bet. I figure this will be funny for maybe one or two days. But the internet gets hold of it, and it starts to go a little bit uh, enthusiastic. It made the front page of Hacker News. Uh, Rockstar Language made Boing Boing Magazine. There were people on Reddit saying nice things about it. Uh, this is funny, pure genius. The docs are hilarious. Shut up and take now. Something happened then, which I really did not expect, is I got an email from a magazine here in the UK called Classic Rock Magazine, which is a real music magazine that interviews you know, Metallica and Guns N' Roses and people like that. And they wanted to do an article about Rockstar. Um, and they did. And I made it in Classic Rock Magazine with my joke programming language. Now, <laughs> that wasn't the weirdest part. The really, really fun part happened when people started filing issues against the GitHub repository and opening pull requests. And I said to them, why are you filing issues? And they said, there's some undefined behavior in the specification. And I said, well, why does that matter? They said, I'm building a Rockstar compiler in Scala. And I was like, sorry, you're doing what? And they're like, yeah, yeah, I built a, a Scala compiler for Rockstar at the weekend, and I have an edge case, and I need to know what the correct behavior is. And within a couple of weeks, 
people were building compilers. There's, if you put a .rock file into Visual Studio Code, something pops up in the corner and says there's syntax highlighting available for this, and it'll download syntax highlighters for Rockstar. You know, the, the, the number of people who were contributing their own ideas to this thing just blew me away. It was completely unexpected. And this thing just kept rolling and rolling and rolling. And after a couple of months, it was still going strong. And I thought, you know, I don't feel like I've really done enough work to deserve everything that's going on. And so at the beginning of last year, I decided I was going to build my own Rockstar interpreter. And I was going to do it in JavaScript for one very good reason. I wanted this to be something on a website that anybody in the world could go and they could type in their Rockstar program. They could click one button in their browser and they were a Rockstar developer. And so I created codewithrockstar.com. This is all open source. You can find the code for it on GitHub. You can go there right now and you couldn't put in your Rockstar program and you can click rock and you will be a Rockstar developer. Now, I just want to say thank you to somebody. That Rockstar logo up in the, the, the top corner there, I wanted something that was really kind of over the top, pure 1980s rock and roll. And I came up with this, but this was influenced by Microsoft Consumer Products 1980 to 1982. They're not using that logo anymore, so I thought I'd recycle it. Now, Unfortunately, this being a virtual conference, I cannot give out the certified Rockstar developer certificates to you all in person, but go online, try out Rockstar for yourself, play around with it, put what you've done on Twitter. Next time we can all meet up in person, we'll be able to show me your code. I'll give you some of these wonderful wipe clean self-adhesive certificates, and you can be part of the world's most prestigious developer program. And finally, do you remember the Hello World in Pete that you can hang on the wall? And do you remember the chocolate cake in Chef that was a real chocolate cake? I'd like to wrap up today by performing FizzBuzz for you in Rockstar. If we could get the audio up on the Zoom feed, please, engineers. I'm going to leave you with this. Now, you can't see this in the stream, but I will be performing this live for you. <laughs> All right, let's do this.
Thank you, Dot Next. That was The Art of Code, live streamed from London. Thank you, Dylan. Thank you, Igor. Oh, that was amazing. That, uh, <laughs> yeah. Of course, we would like, like many hours of you playing and singing for us, but yeah, that's what we can afford right now. Uh, <laughs> I have an immediate question. I have an yeah. immediate question after this performance. So you have a Rockstar programming language and you, of yep. course, uh, write some lyrics, but does yep. the Rockstar has any kind of a standard library for the musical part? Like no. you, you write yeah. some lyrics and then you grab the music. How do you do that? Um, so, so a lot of people have said, can we, that does Rockstar actually make music? And no, it doesn't. But in theory, the, you could do something like write Rockstar programs that create uh, MIDI files or Rockstar programs that have some kind of output that can be translated into actual music. But no, at the moment, it is, it is purely about lyrics. It is just a way of writing programming languages that, uh, you know, look like song lyrics. Okay, and uh, talking about those uh, like strange or esoteric languages, question is, uh, why do you think they might be, or can they be useful for like regular developers like us? So I am a .NET developer, and I, frankly speaking, I learned some like. I um, get acquainted with some languages only from your talk. Now I, I've heard about some, but not all of them. So why would they might be useful for me or for some other developers in the real life? Like, um, okay. So first do not use esoteric languages to do your job. They are not for that. Do not use them at work. Do not use them in production. Uh, do not anybody go home and go, oh, we're going to rebuild our website in Rockstar. Uh, that's not what they're for. They are for fun. They are also a useful way of studying how programming languages are created. Uh, you know, if you need to sit down and build a compiler uh, because you want to understand how compilers work, then, you know, you shouldn't, there's already a C compiler. That already exists. There's already JavaScript interpreters. There's already Ruby interpreters. So for building compilers and interpreters, it's fun to start with something that doesn't exist yet as a way of learning how to do it. Um, and that's that's what I did with the Rockstar interpreter that, that you can find on GitHub, is I started out, okay, I understand what the language is supposed to do, but I have no idea how to make that happen. And so as a, a learning and a teaching tool, esoteric languages are a lot of fun. And you know, also there are some, some languages out there which are deliberately designed to be almost impossible to write. There's a language called uh, Intercal and there's one called Malbolge. And with those, just getting a program to compile in them can be a, an interesting challenge in its own right. So they're good kind of, you know, learning exercises and they're lots of fun, but no, they're not they're not useful, you know, they are art. And the, the point of art is that you smile and you learn something and then you go and go and get on with your day, you know? 
yeah, well, <laughs> sometimes I don't think it's like a very smiley thing to look at some of the programs you, you, you've shown, so especially without syntax highlighting like the white space. <laughs> uh, so we have something in the chat. Let me quickly check. Yeah, people are asking when, when and how can we get to the live concerts finally? So <laughs> yeah, when they uh, open the borders, of course. <laughs> Yeah, we're all waiting for that. Uh, so another question was that the, you showed the Sonic Pi, which is not mm -hmm. really a, a language. Well, it is a language, but yeah. I'm not sure how Turing complete it is. And uh, it, is it feels complete. like it, that one was created with some uh, practical needs. So mm -hmm. are there like, where is the boundary between the like uh, the practical language that you can probably use for some very niche thing, and then uh, the those uh, mind-bending languages that uh, are just for the theoretical investigation? Uh, I mean, have you seen any kind of uh, esoteric or maybe almost esoteric language to actually be promoted to some kind of the usefulness? Into the, so, uh, into the there is a, world. There is a, there's a language called Lily Pond, and Lily Pond is a domain specific language for creating sheet music. So it, it's not for creating music, it's for creating printed sheet music for orchestras. Um, and Lily Pond is based on Scheme. It uses a context free grammar and it uses a whole bunch of ideas from the Scheme language. But the output of a Lily Pond program is a piece of manuscript paper with sheet music printed on it and it was designed for doing very very high quality musical engraving because you know printed sheet music if there's any any musicians who know how to read music that is a domain with all of its own you know syntax and conventions about how do you join notes and how do you indicate rests and keys and this very rich typography and and grammar of how to communicate musical scores through a printed format um, and lily pond is a very ex interesting example of a computer language language that is useful for that niche and it doesn't do anything else. It's not a general purpose language at all. And, you know, there are, there are examples of this all over the place. You know, I mean, JavaScript was originally just a glue language in a browser for combining Java applets. That's all it was ever supposed to do. And obviously, you know, the, the world we live in, JavaScript does a lot more than combining Java applets in a browser. Um, but, you know, there are lots of examples of small languages, machine and computer languages that were created just to do one specific application or work with one specific kind of output. Um, and, uh, you know, there's, uh, like I said, interesting, some of them are just weird examples of languages for the sake of being weird, but others have real, genuine, genuine applications. Yeah, so some of them are really becoming very niche, but uh, at the same time, they are like, yeah. Uh, yeah. becoming mainstream to some extent. Uh, so uh, another thing that's about like, mm, okay, so you were mm, like having, uh, you wanted to have some fun and then you get up and uh, created the Rockstar language itself. Mm -hmm. But then uh, turns out that people are like, okay, got the idea and start creating compilers and then you yourself decided mm -hmm. that you also need okay interpreter but it's kind of a compiler yeah. so why do you think uh, yeah you had some fun so yep. fine <laughs> uh, why, do, why do people actually like invest time into that i mean uh, and uh, you knowing that there are a lot of other compilers or maybe not a lot of but at least some rockstar compilers you also decided to build your own so yeah. why do you think it happens so well in my case one was curiosity i wanted to, to know how to do it but also um you know there were a uh, rockstar because it's silly and it's fun a lot of people who are not interested in computer science or computer programming came across it and they're like, oh, this, this looks like fun. I want to try this. Um, and you know, for those people, it's like, well, first you need to install a Node.js interpreter higher than version 12, and then you need to do an NPM install Rockstar, you know, so an, a language that, or a transpiler that is built in Python or Scala does not offer the immediacy. It's one of the biggest things with any kind of technology adoption, whether it's a joke programming language or a completely new 
you, you know, serious business application is how long does it take for someone to try it out? What's involved in them being able to pick it up and play around with it for just five minutes and tell whether it's any good or not? And the for me, the best, best way of doing that was it runs in a browser. So you, you you click a link, there's a Rockstar interpreter, you type in your program and you press a button and it's it, that it's done, you know. Um, and there's various ways that I could have done that using, you know, like web service calls to a back end. I could have, you know, spun up a container with one of the Scala interpreters or um, there's one called Rocky, which is built in Java. Uh, and, you know, I kind of, I looked at that, but then I, I thought the other thing that, that Rockstar didn't have was a reference implementation. There was no kind of definitive, this is correct and this passes the test suite. And if you want your compiler to be a fully 100% Rockstar compatible, this is what you need to, to shoot for. And so partly I created it because I wanted a reference implementation as a way of, of testing whether changes to the language spec were going to break other people's code or not. Partly I wanted it as, like I said, something that you could just open up in a browser and you could run with no installation, no package manager, nothing. And partly, just like I said, it was curiosity. I hadn't built it any compiler since I was at university, and I thought it would be fun to see how much I could remember. Um, it turns out not very much, but it also turns out that compiler engineering has advanced a lot since 1998. And uh, there's something called a parsing expression grammar now, which I don't think we had back when I was doing it the first time around. So yeah, those are, those are the three reasons. You know, one was I, I wanted this to be in a browser. Um, two is is curiosity, um, and three was reference implementation. Uh, you know, kind of fixed target for people who wanted to get involved with this. Yeah, thank you. Uh, t talking about mainstream languages, yeah. I would say that based on my, at least my experience, uh, some of them are also may look fairly cryptic. Uh, <laughs> in my history, I've, I've programmed a little bit uh, on Perl, and the mm -hmm. Perl program can be like very, it's a complete regular expression all the way for all the screen, and then it apparently it runs. And yep. uh, when, I, when, uh, when I came into the .NET world, it was a C Sharp 2 something, I think, and uh, it was very like, lengthy in terms of all the keywords and delegates things so no lambdas no nothing so you had to type a lot and then now in the latest c sharp edi uh, editions let's say or versions uh, yep. i see a um, kind of a trend of making things more compact with all those uh, uh, exclamation mark here, exclamation mark there, and now after the parameter name, it means that it will be automatic null checking. Isn't it a trend <laughs> that the mainstream language is also trying to become more, I don't know, cryptic, less typing? Why is that? Why, why do you think it's going this way? So, you know, the, the, the classic question with any kind of language or platform design is do you build a, a very, very small set of operations and then expect the developers to create everything else themselves, whether that's the community or that's the teams who are actually working with it. Um, you know, it is possible to build everything in C because if you have enough time and you have the expertise, you can build uh, network protocol analyzers in C, you can build HTTP stacks in C, you can build model view controller in C, you can build your, your Razor templating engine in C, uh, but we don't do that because those problems are very, very common and lots of people have them. And so the solutions have been uh, what we call commoditized, which means that everyone can just get the same solution and use it. And, you know, I, I see what I see happening with C Sharp particularly is this idea of, you know, there are, there are problems that they see coming up time and time again. Like uh, way back, if anyone remembers the days of .NET 1.0, where everything was an array list, but an array list always returned object. And so lots and lots of code was, you know, get this element out of the array list and then cast it back to customer or cast it back to HTTP response or cast it back to something. And so it was obvious a lot of people had the same problem. And so generics was created as a way of solving that. So instead of an array list, you could have an array list of T. And then, you know, we started the task parallel library that was introduced. That was a way of doing asynchronous programming that wasn't 
part of the language, it was part of the framework. So the compiler didn't care. These were just another set of classes that you could bring into your program, and the compiler would compile them. And that gave you some asynchronous callbacks and cancellation mechanisms. And then so many people started adopting that for building high performance code that async and await became language features. You know, the C sharp people went, well, actually, instead of having to instantiate a new task of T with a result and, uh, you know, exception handling, why don't we just say async? can await and then the compiler can can do all the boilerplate for you um, and of course the constant challenge is there's half the people going oh c sharp used to be so easy and it's like well yeah but when it was easy it wasn't powerful when it was easy it was a glue language for sticking together a lot of dlls to do interesting things but the language itself um, you know, you spent a lot of time writing the same kind of code over and over again. Uh, when, I, when I first started programming, I probably spent two or three days each week just writing code to get data out of a database table and turn that into an object because we didn't have object relational mappers. And so I'd be like, you know, run a command and then customer.firstname equals data reader dot get string first name. And you remember, and you did this, and now we have object relational mappers and we kind of don't think about that stuff anymore because it's part of the ecosystem. Um, and it wouldn't surprise me if a language comes along that's like, well, actually, we're just going to put a, um, you know, a, a method that retrieves things from the database directly as part of the language. It's not even a library anymore. But of course, then people go, well, the language is getting bloated. There's all these features that I don't need. And so it's a really difficult balance to strike between does the language stay small and compact like C has, and nobody uses it because they have to do everything themselves, or do you throw in absolutely every feature you can think of and try and make the language as, as, as big as you can? Um, and I, I sort of see that happening with JavaScript, particularly the Node.js ecosystem a little bit, is there's libraries that do everything. Like there's a library for padding strings as if that was difficult. You know, you need a plugin yeah. to do that for you. Um, and, you know, so it's, it's, it's a difficult balance. Yeah. People, I think when you learn a new language, if you learn the right language at the right point in your own career, then you kind of fall in love with it a little bit, which is what happened with me and, and C Sharp. And now when it gets new stuff, I always like, oh, cool, this is C Sharp. I love C Sharp. Let's see what it's got. But I can see how somebody yeah. who doesn't start out with that perspective. <laughs> yeah, and I think it's uh, now time to let the broadcast continue. Right. And we will switch to the Zoom room for the further questions. Thank you, Dylan, for the talk. Uh, that was amazing as usual. In the discussion. Yeah, it was a great show. <laughs>